Bill later recalled that it all started on Friday evening. It was March, and the weather had warmed up. The trees were blooming, and the lawn was turning green after the harsh winter. He and his wife, Susan Fleming, were lounging on the couch watching some romantic thriller on the flat screen. Over five years of marriage, they discovered that they could talk about almost anything. This included politics, religion, current events, and, thankfully, sex. They were opposites when it came to politics. Bill believed that most of the officials were idiots just wanting to tax him to death, while Susan liked their board members. She even exclaimed once about how dreamy he looked in his suit when he was running for president. Bill just shook his head. He thought the asshole looked like the used car salesman he was. Regarding religion, they actually agreed. They were born-again Christians and were lenient towards those who did not believe as they did. Sexually, they were willing to try almost anything. The only thing is about either tried to stay away from anything that might have to do with children. There it was an absolute. Anyway, Bill later thought about their whole story and tried to reconcile what they did to each other and whether it had anything to do with what happened next. Susan cleared her throat a couple of times before pausing the movie they were enjoying. The plot included teases about open relationships and spouse swapping. In the film, the man sought to study other women, but the woman was very hesitant, if not resistant to the idea. Susan bit her lip and then brought up the topic. Bill, how much do you love me? Bill sat down immediately. Aside from the dreaded, honey, we need to talk, this was the most dangerous question he thought anyone could ask. If he were 20 years old, he might have responded, I love you so much that I would do anything for you. Instead, at 35, he knew how to guard his comments. Well, Susan, it depends on a few things. If you want a kidney or a piece of my liver, then I'm ready. I would do this so you could live a full life. If you were attacked, I would intervene before the gunman to protect you at the possible cost of my own life. If you want my heart, baby, you already have it. Why do you ask? He was already afraid of the possible answers, since this question usually implied doing something that was completely contrary to the moral code of the person being asked. Susan a few moments chuckled and muttered before trying to sell softly. You know that I love you more than anything in the world. If you needed anything, I would move heaven and earth to help you. I would do anything for you. That's why I believe you would do the same for me. Bill knew that we were not talking about something like a new pair of very expensive shoes or a handbag. This will be serious. He indicated that she should continue. I have the opportunity to expand my horizons through work. This will require some overnight travel and even a few nights when I'm here in town. My boss, Trey, gave me this opportunity. Salary, and I'll probably pick up some new skills. Bill was suspicious of these horizons, so he asked, What are these new horizons, dear? Susan for a while again chuckled and meowed. He could see that she was trying to explain it in terms that would be ambiguous enough that he might not understand everything. Um, Lisa Tennant is our current special company ambassador. She has been doing this job for several years and now wants to cut costs and be at home more often. Trey thinks I would do well in this position. This entails meeting clients and potential clients and attracting them to our company. This is important work. You are now an administrative secretary. What specific skills do you need to acquire in order to engage in this courtship, as you put it? Susan grunted and wrinkled something again. I believe I have most of the necessary skills. There are just a few skills that Trey said I would need to be a great special envoy. Bill tilted his head to the side, indicating that he was unsure but wanted her to continue. She took a deep breath and continued. Some of the responsibilities involve playing hostess at meetings. I used to be a waitress so it won't be hard, but Trey said I'll have to bartend from time to time so it won't be hard, so I'll be taking a bartending course to help with that. She stopped and looked at him. Sorry, but being a waitress and bartender doesn't require you to ask me how much I love you. What else? Well, Lisa told me that I would also be responsible for the personal needs of clients. This could include escorting someone to a gala or dinner, being a personal shopper from time to time, 
or even providing entertainment as needed. Let me guess, accompanying a male client to an event, buying things, possibly very personal items, and you can't sing or play a musical instrument. I'm guessing the fun might be sexual in nature. He tried to remain calm as he gave her his interpretation of the work. She saw his face getting redder. She bit her lip and nodded. He continued, I'm guessing the skills you don't have but need are some types of sex. She nodded slowly. She realized that she had done everything wrong. Perhaps she should have waited until nighttime and after they had sex. Then he might be more receptive. I see, and where are you going to learn these new skills? I'm sure Trey said that he would be ready to provide the necessary skill, and Lisa would teach you the intricacies of sex. Am I right? Again, she nodded slowly. And how much do professional concierges earn these days? I was promised an extra dollar twenty thousand a year as long as I performed. If I performed up to par, it could be more. Who sets the standard tray? Yeah, and Lisa too. We'll need to get some practice before I can date clients. You've always refused a lot in bed, and I've never seen you show the slightest interest. On the contrary, it usually turns you off. Why the sudden change? Well, Trey told me how much he and his wife enjoy it, and Lisa said she loves it too, and the customers go crazy about it. I'm a little curious. Bill went in a different direction with his questions. So how long have you and Trey and Lisa been practicing so far? Susan pulled back. Obviously, she wasn't expecting this question. She hesitated again and chewed her lip. Lisa and I kissed several times. This is all? Yes. Do you like women? Susan was indignant. No, what do you think? Bill attacked. Yes, if you get paid, it's when it's due. You should act like it's the nicest thing you can do. Susan was furious and upset. Why does Bill behave this way? First, he's clearly upset that she's even considering a new job, and now he seems upset that she's so hesitant. What does he want? And what did you do for Trey so that he thinks you want this job? She blushed with embarrassment and nodded. When did you do this? Today? Yesterday? She whispered, last Friday in his office. It was right after he asked if I wanted the job. So, you've been silent for almost a week about what happened in the office. What else did you do and when? She didn't answer him. And when are you meeting your first client? Tomorrow. She nodded. So why are you asking my permission to do this? It's obvious that you've already decided that at 36, you've accumulated all the skills, well, almost all, necessary to be a professional woman of easy virtue. You're going to train to get back your 25-year-old self. Summer body, or will you go with an almost medieval female figure with a little bulging belly? She had to admit that she didn't know if she needed to work out to tone her body. She got used to her body, just as she got used to Bill's body. He also had a small belly. When asked about permission, she replied, I thought if you love me enough, you'll let me spread my wings a little. You'll also enjoy the new skills I'll learn. And Lisa said she'd love to come here. If you notice, I'm not happy about any of this. He stopped. I guess it's too late to say no, isn't it? She nodded. Well, do what you think is right for you. I won't ask you to do what's right for me and our marriage, since that's obviously not your priority right now. Susan began to cry. It didn't go the way she imagined. She truly believed that Bill loved her enough to allow her to explore and expand her horizons. Finally, she stopped and sobbed some more. Can we just go to bed and think about it? I wanted to make love to you tonight, of all nights, but now I guess it's impossible. Finally, you got something right. I am so far from the thought of making love to you that you can be my grandmother, but with less feeling. As for sleep, I'm too excited right now. I advise you to go and rest. I think you'll need this tomorrow when you start your new career. When she looked at his face, she knew that further discussion was impossible. She nodded and slowly stood up. She was now acting like an old woman. She slowly walked from the living room to the bedroom. As soon as she took off her outerwear, she collapsed on the bed and began to cry again. 
Bill looked at the flat screen TV. Suddenly, romantic movies started to irritate him. He pressed a button to switch to a sports show. He didn't care what he was watching. Even women's hockey would be better than what was included. He poured himself a large glass of whiskey and sat down to consider his immediate future. It didn't look very good. After a while, he took out a notepad and started making a list. He was a very organized person, and lists helped him stay organized. Finally, he got drunk enough and depressed enough that he slowly got up and went to bed. They only had one bed in the house. The other bedrooms were to be refurbished as needed when Susan became pregnant. He figured her new job would put an end to that dream too. He took off his jeans and shirt and lay down next to his prostitute wife. She finally fell asleep, and it only took him a few minutes to pass out. The next day was Saturday, not one of his usual work days, and, until today, not one of Susan's work days either. He got up and got dressed. Susan was still sleeping. She didn't even notice that he wasn't in bed. He shrugged. First, he needed Tylenol and water. He's not used to drinking. In fact, the bottle of whiskey he tried to kill last night was over a year old and more than half full. This was no longer the case. He chuckled at this. Will he become drunk now? He shrugged at his own mental question. He ate some cereal and then found his list. He squinted, trying to read the last few paragraphs before discarding them. It wouldn't be in his best interest to pull out a gun and shoot her. Some other ideas made sense and required further exploration. First on his list was finding a new place to live. He had no intention of staying in this house when his wife returned from her first date. He called a property manager he knew. This manager was an old friend and was ready to help his friend. He had several suggestions that would be suitable for the first time. Bill met with him and chose the second of the proposed places as his temporary home. His friend knew of a moving company that could be at the house immediately after Susan left and pack his things in no time. He could have been completely moved by that same night. Bill nodded and thanked his friend before heading back into the house. This was no longer his home. Susan got up and took a shower. She asked about his feelings about her new job. He shrugged and simply replied that if that's what she wanted, he couldn't stand in her way. She jumped up and hugged him. She later realized that he never hugged her back. She said that she was late, so she needed to get dressed quickly and went to do it. He turned on the TV and tried to get carried away with the game, but couldn't. When she came out looking very nice and attractive, he pretended to be too engrossed in the game to give her more than the usual wave as she hurried away. She told him she loved him, and he just muttered back. As soon as her car left the garage, he jumped up and took action. He called a moving company and began gathering everything he could remember to take with him. He pulled various pieces of furniture into the center of the room and stacked them. He then grabbed a suitcase and some containers to fill with his clothes. In the process, he attacked a new bottle of whiskey he had purchased while he was out of the house. A sip here, moving things there, and another sip. Soon the level of whiskey dropped, but he did not feel drunk. The movers arrived, and like a hurricane, his belongings were packed and moved from the house to the truck. His tools were also taken away. His weapons, which he purposefully did not touch so that there would be no accident, were also packed, and soon he looked around and saw just a familiar house, but not his house anymore. It was like a stranger's home. He looked at his list again. It said that he was going to leave a note explaining why and what he was doing. He decided not to do this. He took out his phone and blocked Susan's number. He then called a taxi and went to a furniture store to buy the necessary furniture, including a bed. He knew he was too drunk to drive, so he left his car. He could pick her up on Monday if necessary. Finding a simple bed and mattress and a couple of other things, he arranged for them to be delivered to his new home. When he arrived there, he continued drinking while putting things away. He noticed that alcohol can really help with routine work. He felt that this was a great discovery in life, so he took another drink for himself. Finally, he felt he was done and collapsed into his chair and immediately fell asleep, or lost consciousness. He later realized that he had severe neck pain when he woke up, and his back hurt from the wrong position. 
he stumbled to empty his bladder and then collapsed into his new bed. The next morning he woke up and regained consciousness. He took more Tylenol and drank water to ease the headache and decided not to drink any more. Drinking alcohol was fun, but the hangover was hell. He should have gone back to his usual rare cocktail and left it at that. He spent the day trying to figure out where he put everything when he was drunk. It was a long game of hide and seek. That same morning Susan woke up. She was in pain all over and felt very foggy. Trey said there would only be a couple of clients at this first meeting, but instead there were almost a dozen people there, including Trey, her boss, who also demanded his share. Most of the men were over 50 and overweight, not what she imagined lovers to be. The women were also older and not very attractive. How did Lisa endure this for so many years? She rolled over and opened a blurry eye. Her head hurt, but she didn't drink so much wine that she had a hangover. They could have slipped something into her drink. She remembered feeling great affection for them all at first. She was still in the hotel room and alone. She was also on the floor, naked and cold. She sat up slowly. There was a knock on the door. It was probably the noise that woke her up. She was still trying to get up when the door opened and the maid entered. Susan was horrified to be caught like this. The maid muttered something to her in Spanish. Susan didn't speak or understand a word of Spanish, but she took it as a reproach and that she needed to leave since it was obviously checkout time. Susan looked around and found her coat. The rest of the clothes she wore to her new job seemed threadbare. She put on her coat with difficulty, found her small purse, and headed to the car. She carefully got into the car. She hoped that her new experience would improve their intimate life, but now she doubted it. When she arrived home, she was happy to see Bill's car there, but when she went inside, something was wrong. In her hazy state, it took several minutes before she realized that his favorite chair was missing. His favorite coffee mug, which usually sat on the back of the kitchen table next to the sink, was also gone. She checked the dishwasher, but it wasn't there. She walked around the small house. The table and its shaving accessories were missing. His gun cabinet was also gone, leaving only a heavy mark on the carpet. She went out into the garage and saw that his tools were also missing. The lawnmower was still there, as were the gardening tools. With trembling fingers, she dialed his number and called. After a few rings, the voicemail went on, and she left a message asking where he was. She returned to the house and to the bedroom. I checked the closet, and as expected, his things were empty. He left. A vague feeling did not leave her. The fog in her head prevented her from thinking clearly. It finally dawned on her that he hadn't given her permission to research the new job, he just let her assume it. She took a long, hot shower and went to bed. She was too exhausted to do anything else. She woke up late in the evening when her bladder forced her to stand up. The house seemed cold and lifeless. Just the other day the house seemed so warm and welcoming, but it wasn't like that anymore. Susan heated up a can of soup and forced herself to eat, even though she had no appetite. She checked her phone. Nothing from Bill. She called her parents, but they heard nothing from him and made some snide remarks about what an unreliable person he was for leaving without explaining what was going on. She had such a headache that she could hardly hear them. Fortunately, she was used to their comments and ignored them. If her head didn't hurt so much, she might have told them the truth, that the problem was her and not her husband. She then decided to call Bill's parents. They didn't hear anything from him either. When they asked what the problem was, she began to stutter and mumble that she was just looking for him. To be honest, she felt worse after talking to them. She returned to bed. The next day he called work and said he was sick. He never missed work, so his boss was concerned, but gave Bill space to get better. The next item on his list was to go to the bank and withdraw half of his savings and get a cashier's check. He also visited the storage facility and removed his belongings from the safe, but left behind his wedding ring. He then left the key with the bank manager and went to another large, reputable bank and opened a new checking and savings account. After depositing most of the money there, he called HR and arranged to have his salary directly deposited into the new account. 
He then called all the credit card companies and arranged to have his name removed from all co-branded cards. He paid off several debts and cut a few more to complete the entire job. After visiting a good divorce lawyer, documents were prepared outlining the irreconcilable differences and he arranged to have them delivered to Susan's home. He thought about giving it to her at work, but decided that Trey will expect it, so why give him the pleasure of helping Susan on the first day? Susan will have no one at home to support her. His list said he should call his parents, and he did. He simply told them that he had moved due to some problems. He didn't go into detail. He wanted to call Susan's parents, but they never liked him, and they would have called her right away, so he decided not to. She also called work and said she was sick. Trey told her she did a great job, and he was looking forward to his next meeting with clients. She didn't say no right away, but she didn't intend to do it again. My health has improved a little. She still hoped that Bill would call or come home, so she took a shower and dressed nicely. Even if she didn't feel good, she wanted to look decent if he showed up. She was ready to beg for forgiveness as soon as she saw him. Susan assumed she would hear the garage door if he came to get the car, so she didn't worry too much about it. Her stomach was still a little uneasy from the weekend's events, so she simply prepared another can of soup. She sat down in the most comfortable chair in the living room, the sofa, and waited. Bill would be here soon, she was sure of it. When the doorbell rang at four o'clock in the afternoon, she jumped up and ran to the door, not thinking that Bill would not ring his own doorbell. She opened the door and began to exclaim, Darling, I was so worried but it wasn't her husband on the doorstep. Instead, standing in front of her was a middle-aged man in a very rumpled suit. You Susan Fleming? was all he asked. Confused, she nodded. He shoved a manila envelope into her hands and stepped back to take a photo of her with his phone. You have been served with a summons. Have a nice day. He stepped back from the porch, watching her reaction. It was obvious that some people were not happy to be served with any court documents. He then turned and quickly walked to his car, got in and drove off before Susan could ask a single question. She slowly walked back into the house and placed the envelope on the dining room table, then collapsed into a chair. With trembling hands and tears on her face, she opened the seal and took out the papers. When she saw a headline with the word litigation, she realized that she had made a fatal mistake regarding her relationship with Bill. She crumpled the papers in her hand, leaned over and laid her head on the table, sobbing over the destruction of her marriage and the pain she had caused to the only man she had sworn to love, respect and cherish five years ago in front of God, the priest and their families and friends. When she stopped crying and raised her head, she realized that it was already dusk, and it was the perfect time of day for her current feelings. She needed someone to talk to, and the first thing that came to mind was her mother. Susan took out her phone and dialed a familiar number. Mom, Bill filed for divorce, and I don't know what to do. Of course, Susan's mother, Denise Winters, immediately wanted to know what this scoundrel son-in-law had done to her dear daughter. Susan knew this had to be nipped in the bud. Mom, it's not Bill's fault. I did a terrible thing to him on Friday night and made it worse on Saturday. When I got home on Sunday, he had already moved. I can't reach him to explain how stupid I was. She then had to tell the whole story because her mother didn't believe Bill was innocent. Mom, stop blaming Bill for this. I finally told him on Friday night that I have a new job at work. I've been promoted to special envoy, and that includes some travel and late evenings. Bill wasn't happy, and then I had to fully explain the functions of the job. She stopped. How to tell your own mother that you have agreed to become a corporate woman of easy virtue? Denise was still angry with Bill. Why should that make him move? Does he have a fragile ego because of your success? Are you making more than him now? Are his little feelings hurt? Stop it, Mom. It's not Bill's fault. My new job is to have sex with clients, men and women, to make them happy. I thought Bill's love for me would allow me to do that. It was a disaster on Saturday night. They addressed me as trash. Perhaps a paid woman of easy virtue would be treated better. 
I can't feel more humiliated than I do now. Denise was shocked by what her daughter was telling her. She still couldn't let go of the idea that Bill could be the cause of this whole disaster. Your terrible husband was so bad in bed that you had to look for good sex somewhere else? I'm sure it's his fault. Susan defended her innocent husband. No, Mom, it's the other way around. Bill and I have such a good sex life that I thought that anything I did would make it better, not worse. I thought stories about how every man and woman had sex with my love, there will be wonderful bed stories. It was hell, Mom. It was disgusting and humiliating, not the romantic adventure I had imagined. As for money, it would pay better, but not as much as Bill brings home. And Mom, it was just sex for money. Bill never agreed to it or forbade me because I had already made the decision to do it. I devalued Bill and our marriage, and now it looks like it's over. She fell silent for a few moments. Luckily, her mother was smart enough not to say anything. Finally, she continued. Mom, his car is still here, so I know he'll come for it. Why it's still here, I don't know, but I know he needs it. I can't leave and risk missing him, so can you come? Denise will always blame Bill for this mess, but she was shocked that her daughter decided to do this regardless of Bill's provocation, which she believed took place. She never raised her daughter to do such terrible things, so it had to be something Bill did to bring her to this point. Of course, she will come to Susan. She hung up, texted her husband about what was going on, and headed to the Fleming house. Meanwhile, Bill's lawyer contacted him about some important news. He contacted Susan's Human Resources Department and discussed the special envoy position with the department head. He learned that such a position did not exist and was in direct violation of the company's employee moral character policy. The HR manager was going to call the CEO and inform the board of directors about what Tree Tanning was doing. Bill's lawyer advised him to file a lawsuit against the company and against him personally. Treya Tanning for alienation of affection. Mr. Tanning must feel the pain that Bill and Susan are feeling. Bill told him to take action. He really didn't want any money from this incident. He felt they would all be tainted and might make him feel like a prostitute, but they could be donated to a domestic violence shelter, perhaps even a prostitute rehabilitation shelter. It actually made sense to him. Now what to do with his car? It was late, so Susan was probably at home, and he couldn't go home now. He sat down and thought about it. It finally occurred to him that it was a leased car, and there were only a few months left before the lease expired. He was thinking about buying out the contract because he liked the model. One call, and it was agreed that the company would pick up the current model and deliver the new one to him in the morning. A few minutes later, a dealership representative was at his door to pick up his key and alarm fob. Susan and Denise were sitting on the couch when the doorbell rang. Susan cried again, trying to convince her mother that Bill was not to blame for all this and that she alone was responsible for what was happening. Denise told her to just sit and drink her hot cocoa while she went to the door. Denise really hoped it was Bill at the door. She was going to scold him if it was him. When she opened the door, she was surprised to see a stranger. It took a moment to change the record and mutter, What can I do for you, young man? I need to access the garage to pick up Bill Fleming's rental car. I have his key, but I don't have the door remote. Can you help? Denise called Susan to the door. It was completely unexpected, but since the entire day had been a wild and unusual experience for the two women, it shouldn't have been surprising. As Susan approached the door, the young man again explained his mission. Susan questioned him for a few minutes before realizing he was just a pawn in this game and went to open the garage door for him. He thanked her, waved to his colleague who was waiting at the curb, and pulled the car out of the garage, quickly driving away. Susan now realized that Bill had thought of almost everything. He got in his car without coming home. He moved spontaneously and didn't leave a note. She wondered if he had withdrawn the money and went to her laptop to check her bank account. Most of the money in the checking account was there, but half of the savings were gone. She would need to check the safe as the documents for the certificates of deposit were kept there, but she had a feeling that half would be gone. 
she went back to the divorce papers and checked the division of assets. There you have it, a 5050 split. The house will have to be sold or Susan will have to buy out her share of it. Bill agreed to deposit money into a checking account every month to cover half of the mortgage payment until the house was sold. Now she could only hope that Trey wouldn't fire her when she told him where he could shove his special envoy job because she needed to keep making money or she'd be on the street in six months. Finally, she decided to go with her mother and stay at her old family home for a few days, where she would have someone who could support her. The house she shared with Bill was too cold and lonely. Susan and I spent several difficult days at work. When she arrived on Tuesday, she was greeted by a human resources representative and taken for an interview. When they finished, she was shaking all over. She should have known that the company would not officially approve of such behavior. The HR representative advised Susan that the consequences of the investigation could affect her if she did not fully cooperate. Susan held nothing back in her description of all events. The HR rep was surprised that this went on for years with Lisa and Treem. A call was immediately made to invite Lisa to another conversation. Susan returned to her desk and tried to figure out what to do next. Quit. Where will she go? She doubted she would get any advice from Trey or even from the HR department. And now she felt that the only job for which she was qualified was that of a street woman of easy virtue. Besides, who would want to see a 36-year-old housewife at their event? She laid her head on the table and cried. All her colleagues came over to find out what happened. After all, she had worked there for many years and was friendly with many of them finally called Trey, and he took her to his office, trying to figure out what was happening. Susan finally dried her face and blew her nose. She looked at the man she once respected. Now she saw him as a scoundrel who used everyone he could to advance his career. You lied to me, bastard. You said I would be a respected member of the team, not a woman of easy virtue who would be treated like trash. I'm guessing you even lied about the salary increase. You said my husband would be fine with this. Now I'm getting a divorce, my job and future are in jeopardy, and you're under investigation. Trey was shocked by her revelations. Yes, he hadn't seen Lisa for the last hour, but that wasn't unusual. When did everything change? Yesterday, participants of weekend events made large orders from him. They were looking forward to sleeping with Susan again, and he was already planning when to try her services again. Susan stood up. Oh, by the way, in case it wasn't obvious, I am no longer your special envoy. If there is any retaliation on your part, I will find my husband, take one of his guns, and come back here to shoot your manhood off. I was stupid to listen to you and your Lisa, but I swear to God I won't do it again. I hope you rot in hell. She slammed the door on her way out. She quickly gathered her things and left the building. She was sure that she had already been fired, so there was no point in trying to salvage anything from this place, at least not today. She went to her parents' house and told them what happened. For some reason, Denise began to hate her son-in-law again. Nothing Susan could say changed her belief that Bill was the source of all of Susan's problems. On Wednesday, she called HR and asked about her status as an employee. She was told she could take the rest of the week of paid leave and report to her new department with a new supervisor on Monday. She was also asked to keep her phone handy in case any questions arise. From that point on, the divorce became pretty straightforward. Susan contacted a lawyer and filed a counterclaim. A hearing was scheduled for Friday. She asked for counseling and the judge agreed. Bill and his lawyer shrugged and asked for a few conditions. The judge asked which ones exactly. Your Honor, you have scheduled 10 sessions, but we would like 12. We also ask that the payment for the sessions be at the expense of the wife, Susan Fleming, because it's her request. We would also like to be able to interview each potential consultant, as my client wants a neutral intermediary, not someone with an agenda. The judge agreed to their request, but stated that if Bill could not agree to a therapist within a reasonable time, he would appoint a therapist without conditions and Bill would be required to pay for 12 sessions. Bill nodded in agreement. Thus began the search.
Susan was encouraged by the idea that Bill might be willing to reconcile if he wanted more sessions than she requested. Her lawyer warned her before the hearing that Bill might refuse counseling or request fewer sessions. Over the course of a week, both Susan and Bill interviewed several therapists and also checked references with other divorced people. When the lawyers compared the lists, they found a couple of therapists who were on both lists. Bill still refused to communicate directly with Susan. All their correspondence went through their lawyers. Susan returned to work and braved the gossip. Lisa and Trey were immediately dismissed and escorted to the front door by security. The new head of this department had been promoted, and gossip said that she strictly followed company policies. There were no excuses or second chances as the company tried to rebuild its reputation. Gossips also said that several clients were notified that they had to appoint new representatives or their business would be terminated. Susan simply nodded her head, remained silent, and carried out her duties as best she could. She finally returned to her home. After rearranging the furniture, it became easier to accept the fact that Bill's things were no longer there. However, the house was still a cold and lonely dwelling. Susan looked forward to her therapy sessions, if only to be able to talk to Bill again. She needed to make him believe that she regretted her mistake and understood how much it had damaged their relationship. Her sincere desire was to restore her relationship with Bill. Then came the first session. The therapist, June Wilson, was a mature woman in her fifties. She was an active therapist and also taught at a local university. Although her work was not published, she was trusted and respected by many of her colleagues in the field of marriage therapy. Her straightforward approach to problems appealed to many men, even if they themselves were to blame for their actions. Susan came to the session first in her quest to mend her relationship with Bill. Her husband arrived exactly on time. The two sat across from each other and filled out a questionnaire about their family life, personal history, and the specific events that led them to June, as she preferred to be called, rather than Dr. Dis Wilson. Then came that awkward meeting. The couple sat a few feet apart as they waited for June to review their profiles. She then set them aside and began asking questions to fill in the gaps. She started with family stories. Susan answered first. I was born here and raised by my parents. Many of my friends grew up in single parent or mixed families, but I had never been in that situation. My dad and mom both had good jobs, and we went on vacation every year. On my 16th birthday, I got a car and dated a guy, Frank. We dated for another year before we broke up. I went to college here and graduated with a bachelor's degree in business administration. I work at Total Corporation as a junior executive. I've been working there for almost 10 years. About seven years ago, I met Bill at a party. We hit it off immediately and started dating. At that time, I was quite serious about another man, but almost immediately broke off the relationship with him. I realized that I liked Bill more than any other man I had ever met, even if we had just met. We dated for a long time before we started having sex, but it was worth it. We got along, or so I thought, on all levels. We got married and settled down. We had our families, a few close friends, and each other. We didn't need anything else. In fact, we were planning for me to get pregnant soon before everything fell apart. Now we are here. Susan fell silent, and it became obvious that this was the end of her story. June nodded and asked a few questions about her childhood, but didn't touch on the events that brought the couple to her office. Then she turned to Bill. Please, Bill, if you can, tell us about your childhood and growing up, and then about meeting Susan. I think my childhood was a little like Susan's. I also come from a stable two-parent family, but unlike Susan, I have two brothers and two sisters. I'm not the eldest or the youngest or even the middle child. I'm just one of many children in a loving and stable family. Both my parents work and work hard, but I guess money was always tight trying to feed a family of seven. There were a lot of things we all wanted for ourselves, but we didn't get it. We learned to live with each other and compromise. It wasn't that bad, in fact, if you think about it, it was even very good. My brothers and one of my sisters moved to other states, so we don't see each other like that, often as you would like. When we were little, 
I think our parents couldn't afford big trips every year, so we went camping and fishing. There were a lot of skills you had to master to do it. It made scouting a little easier, I tell you. He stopped and smiled at the hundreds of memories that flooded into his head. I think we could talk for hours about the pranks we all got into, not just me and my brothers. My sisters were tomboys too and could fight just as well as us boys. They were good shots too. I forgot to mention that we were all we hunted deer and pheasants in season to help with meat. Although venison is not my favorite meat, it helped the budget a lot and kept us outdoors most of the time. He stopped to catch his breath. In high school, I wanted to take all the technical classes I could. I passed the prerequisites and barely passed Spanish, but that got me into college. I participated in sports, but I wasn't a first-team player in any sport. When it came to dating, I was quite shy. You wouldn't think so, considering how many brothers and sisters I had, but I was shy. I had occasional dates after getting my driver's license, but nothing serious. I didn't have my first serious girlfriend until I got to college. Her name was Rita. She was a nerd like me. We both studied to be engineers and constantly studied together. Then graduation came and I took a job here in the city, and Rita accepted a job offer on the coast and left a few days after graduation. She wasn't local, so she didn't have family to keep her around. I missed her, but I realized that I missed the sex and the study partner more than Rita herself. I loved her, but I wasn't in love with her. Then I started dating again occasionally, trying to find the one I wanted to be with. Yes, there was sex from time to time, but the relationship never lasted longer than six to eight months before each of us realized that the depth of feeling was simply not the same. Then there was that party where I met Susan. I was just there out of respect for a friend, a wing friend of sorts. I wasn't looking for someone to date, but I saw Susan across the room and I just had to meet her. One day I awkwardly approached her and started a conversation, and we hit it off, as she already said. We started dating, and I knew that she was the one, the only one for me. We dated for a long time before getting engaged. I think my engineering mind wanted to be logical and have absolute confidence in us before deciding on a lifelong relationship. I never regretted this decision until recently, when Susan's work became more important than ours. June made a note and then looked at him. How is it that the job Susan has been doing since you met her suddenly becomes a problem? Bill waved his hand towards Susan. I think she should tell her side of the story first. June looked at Susan and expressed confusion. Susan blushed and began to tell the rest of her story. I was approached by my boss and a colleague with an offer to take on a new position as a special envoy to help three my boss to increase sales. This was supposed to include occasional business trips and even more infrequent local assignments to attract clients. Lisa, the previous messenger, also tried to convince me that this could help me and our marriage. She stopped and looked at Bill for support in her confession. The dark expression on his face made it clear that he had no intention of letting her go. She sighed and continued. The special envoy's job involved having sex with whoever Trey chose to seal the deal so to speak. Lisa even had to teach me everything. They tried to convince me to deceive Bill and keep him in the dark about the new features of the job but I decided to talk to Bill and get his consent to do this because I fully believed in the idea that it would help my career and at the same time spice up our sex life. She stopped and looked at Bill again. The expression on his face did not change. She took a deep breath and continued. I started the conversation that Friday night by asking him how much he loved me. After he told me he was willing to give his life to protect me from danger, or give me a kidney or part of a liver so I could live, I believed that he would eventually agree that my new job would be good for us. I even asked for his approval and thought I got it, but now I understand that he told me to do what I thought was right, and I went and did it. What was wrong? The next day I treated myself as I had to meet my boss and some clients at a hotel in the city center. I felt great and was looking forward to the evening. I completely misunderstood his feelings and didn't realize that he was already planning to leave me that day. She paused for a moment and looked at her hands. 
the cloth she had used to wipe away her tears was torn and made a mess on her lap. She took a moment to clear away the scraps before continuing. When I arrived at the hotel, I discovered that there were not just a few clients, but men and women. They were older and out of shape. They treated me like a cheap woman of easy virtue. I realized then that my boss was thinking about me and what the clients think of me. I'm just a woman of easy virtue. I had no value, I was just a piece of meat that was used and thrown away. I got up when the maid started cleaning the room and went home in only my coat. She cried for a while. Even Bill, who had closed his heart to her, was tempted to come closer and comfort her, as he did not know what really happened that night. He has had no direct contact with her since then. Unknown to him, she was actually enjoying her first outing. He felt sorry for her, and at the same time not sorry. If only she had foreseen what her actions would lead to. Susan blew her nose and dried her eyes. She looked at Bill and was pleased to see that his features had softened a little. Then she looked at June. Their therapist was careful to maintain a neutral expression. She wanted more information, and any change in facial expression or body language could stop or change the story. She motioned for Susan to continue. I went home, as I said, and was glad that Bill's car was still in the garage. When I went inside, I soon realized that he was gone. His favorite chair, his clothes, his mug, his shaving supplies, his tools, everything disappeared. He left. I tried to call him, but he didn't answer. I tried to send a message, but he didn't answer either. I called my mother and asked if she had heard anything from Bill. She blamed him for everything, even after I explained what I had done. She still thinks it's all Bill's fault. She looked at her husband with an apologetic expression on her face. He shrugged, as this was not news to him. Her parents never loved him. I took the next day off so I could be home when Bill came to pick up his car. He canceled the lease and called someone from the dealership to pick it up. My mother was here when he came to pick it up. I know she was hoping that it would be Bill so she could tell him off, but even she was disappointed. Bill's parents talked to me, but they couldn't tell me where he was because they didn't know. I was served with the divorce notice that same day, and here we are. She took a deep breath as she finished. The last words came out with strong emotions. She looked at Bill. I can't say this enough, darling, but I'm so sorry I did this to you and to us. I don't know why I thought it would be a good idea. I was fully aware of what I was doing, but somehow I believed that this would be good for us. I planned to do this for a few years and then focus on having our children. I ruined everything. She got up and left the room. She needed to find some place, perhaps a bathroom, to just sit and cry before returning home to the cold and lifeless house she occupied. After she left, June and Bill looked at each other in silence for a while. Bill couldn't read her body language to tell if she wanted him to go after his wife. Bill didn't intend to. He loved Susan, but she hurt him and their relationship so much that he couldn't see living with her again. What if she has another crazy idea about how to improve their sex life and tries it? No scenario played out well in his head. He told June about this. He decided to describe his thoughts and fears to her. She asked a counter question. Has Susan ever done this before? Did she have fantasies? Bill should have answered no to the first three questions, but about Susan's fantasies he stopped, thought for a moment, and shrugged. June indicated that their time for the first session was over. She gave Bill homework regarding his thoughts and feelings about that critical weekend. She assured him that Susan would receive the same assignment, although she had already stated her thoughts about it all a debacle. June also told Bill that she was going to take a deeper look into why Susan thought it was a good idea from the start. He nodded in agreement and stood up and left. The work continued. Bill was offered a settlement of his lawsuit against Susan's company for alienation of affection. He agreed and directed his lawyer to anonymously transfer money to various local and regional agencies dedicated to helping victims of domestic violence. He also helped fund a local law firm specializing in domestic violence cases, as many of their clients were too poor to afford adequate representation in the fight for justice. Susan was pleased with her new position. 
There have been very few rumors about her role in the scandal that caused Tree Munson and Lisa Tennant to lose their jobs. She explained this by the newness of her position. She still felt lonely returning home, but hoped that therapy sessions would help her and Bill become closer again. June changed some of their sessions together to private sessions, mostly with Susan. She sought progress in understanding Susan's motives in accepting the position of special envoy, and then, instead of the usual hiding of activity, trying to get Bill's approval for extra-familial sex. Susan had to admit that being an only child made her feel privileged, a feeling she carried into her marriage. On a subconscious level, she believed that any decision she made would be automatically supported by Bill. They were so compatible that there was never any serious disagreement or discussion of serious topics. At least she now understood how much her behavior had damaged their relationship and what the consequences might be. She still hoped that divorce could be avoided. Bill also had several private sessions with June. He laid out his reasons for his behavior and his expectations for the marriage. Although his expectations were not unusual, June pointed out that he and Susan never sat down and fully discussed their goals, wants, and needs. Once again, their natural compatibility worked against them. Both thought the other was on the same page regarding their life together. June also explored Susan's parents' hostility towards Bill. Although they were not her patients, they played a role in this event. The fact that Susan's mother still blamed Bill for her behavior was troubling. In the future, whatever it may be, Denise's constant reproaches will become a constant problem for Susan. Bill asked Susan out on several dates to see if they could build a relationship again. The dates went well, whether it was dinner, dancing, or watching a movie. But when the evening was over, Susan couldn't get Bill to go home, to a hotel, or even to his apartment for sex. He just didn't show interest. During their last session together, Susan raised the issue of lack of true affection and sex with June. June then asked Bill about his feelings, and he was straightforward. Since that Friday night when she told me she was going to do it, and that the next day was already planned, and she had every intention of doing it, I haven't had any sexual feelings for her. She could have been one of my sisters. I have no interest in rekindling or even attempting to rekindle this aspect of our relationship. In fact, unless you have any more questions for me, I'm done here. I attended these sessions to understand why Susan decided to do this. You've done a wonderful job digging into her reasons and continuing to help her. But I have, however, accepted the transfer to another facility and will be moving in the coming weeks. He turned to stun Susan. I advise you to allow the divorce to run its course as stated in the documents. Any delay on your part for any reason and I will return to your company and demand that you be fired and blacklisted in this city. I will send copies of your statements to everyone who I consider important to you so that you feel their anger or perhaps just disappointment in what you did. I also changed the phone numbers and only my parents and my boss know them. Don't try to get them to help you contact me. I told them that we had differences that could not be overcome because they love you very much. No hotel, so I would have to tell them what you really are like. He stopped at the door. I really hope everything goes well for you. Find a good man and treat him with the same respect he treats you. Don't make mistakes like that again. He went out and closed the door behind his wife and his past life. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think, click to the next one.